So I bought a 1975 vintage Fender Strat with the original hard shell case. You can pick up these 70 Strats pretty inexpensively, relatively inexpensively for a vintage piece of gear. And then on top of that, you add mods that previous owners have added and that drops the price even more. So I got this for a great price. Let's take a look. Oh, yes. Oh, this thing has got some serious mojo. That's why I picked this one up. You know, there's certainly other options out there when you're picking a vintage instrument. Some are in like immaculate condition and those are just boring. And some have been played and those are the ones that I'm attracted to. This thing is dirty. Got some serious mojo. It's been modded. And I'll go through those mods when we take a closer look from the tip of the headstock all the way to the bridge. It does have the original F stamped period correct tuners. They look really great. And of course we have the three screw neck plate with the stamped serial number. I just love this guitar. So though the back of the neck is polyurethane, the front face of the headstock is actually nitro. And the reason for this is that apparently there was some kind of issue with the Fender logo sticker and polyurethane. So Fender just used nitro and it's very clear that this is nitro because it has that vintage patina, that dark amber hue that you only get with age. Now the same aged patina can be found on the body too. The body and the headstock are the same color. Although in the 70s, Fender did move towards polyurethane bodies and polyester bodies. This is also the era that Fender introduced the two string trees on the headstock. You can also tell it's a 70s Strat from the bullet truss rod right there. So total giveaway, this is a 70s Strat. This nut is really interesting. I couldn't tell you if that's an original nut or not. I've never seen one that color before. It's like a very, very off white plastic. You can see their immediate discoloration from the headstock to the board. Next to every fret marker, there's a step. So you can see the raw wood here and then a step to the poly. Same thing here. Lots of exposed wood and then exposed wood there. And the amount of poly still left on the board is very thin. So that step is super thin. And then you have these really interesting striations here next to every fret. And I don't know what that is. It could be scratches, but it's nearly on every fret. Probably just sloppy tech work or sloppy luthier work. Now, the other reason why I got this uh, guitar so inexpensively was because the pickups aren't original. And everybody wants the original gray bottom bobbins from this era. And that's one of the really cool things about the 70s guitars. They had gray bobbins and you had a stamp on each one of the pickups at the very bottom that you could date the guitar. These aren't the original pickups and I'm okay with that. So the 70s strats had three way switches up until about, I don't know, 79. That's a five way. Thank goodness, because I don't know if I could live with a three-way switch. So this is the original jack and the original jack plate. We have the original 70s bridge. One of the reasons why I liked this particular 75 was because of the amount of pieces. A lot of the times these are gonna be three, four or five piece bodies. And that's okay if you have an opaque color, but the transparent ash when you see the different wood grains kind of clash, it looks terrible, right? And this one had the least amount of clashing, especially from this piece here. So there's a seam here and you have a grain on this piece and the grain on this piece, and it looks great. It doesn't clash too much. These 70 strats were notorious for sloppy neck joints, and they also had the micro tilt system. So you can see that there's definitely a gap there. Like the micro tilt system is being engaged and it's pushing the back of that neck up. Now there's a plate on the actual neck. So you have metal to metal touching, but I might reduce the micro tilt system and bring it down so I have wood touching wood and just adjust the saddles. The board is just beautiful. Original strap buttons. So they have that patina 
three bolt the neck plate with the micro tilt. You want to get one of these 70 strats where you have the stamp on there. There's some that don't, and that's okay, but I wanted one like these. And you can see there's been a an etching here that someone erased. So at one point, this was etched, and then they kind of removed it. I've seen old solder before, and it doesn't look that shiny, so this has probably been reflowed, maybe even a couple of times. That string claw and those screws are totally original. And so is the... There's a stamp there with a number, and I'm not sure what that number is. I'll look into it later. Don't have the original back plate cover, and that's perfectly okay because I removed them from all my strats. No worries there. See that third piece here where it protrudes from this lower horn and disappears once it goes and dips in. Then you see it again here. All the poly in the back of the neck is still there. And even quite shiny. And you have kind of the standard dents and dings at the edge of the back of the headstock. Case is in pretty good shape. There's nothing in here. I was hoping for some kind of case candy, but there's nothing. No hang tags. But I am happy I have the original hard shell case in this beautiful vintage orange interior. So I've been playing this guitar and it sounds phenomenal. I am totally in love with it. There's certainly some mojo, and I know that mojo is not a real thing, but it's kind of a real thing. And this guitar definitely has some mojo. Maybe mojo is just how the guitar makes you feel. Maybe it's how the guitar interacts with you, the feedback it gives you. Sometimes certain guitars fight back. This is one of those type of guitars, and it sounds just beautiful. The other thing that I noticed after plugging it in is that the screw head for the jack plate actually went through the hole. So we either need to find a larger screw head or figure out a way to keep the original screw and just keep it from coming off. We're gonna take off the neck, take some photos, date it, uh, take a look at the inside, see if we see any stamps, date those as well. That's it, I'm, I'm not gonna clean this. This thing is looking gorgeous. So according to the Fender website and a few other sources, this is the era that Fender actually started using polyester in the 1970s, but it's also when they started using polyurethane. Somebody's actually had a polyurethane undercoat and nitro on top. So I suspect that this body is nitro on top because the actual lacquer is coming off from the body. I think it's pretty apparent that the headstock face and the body being the exact same color just means they use the same lacquer and the lacquer aged the same way. And you can see that the fretboard has got that pale poly and the sides of the headstock, as well as the back of the neck, are also poly. So, pretty clear indication that this guitar probably has a nitro lacquer on the body. This is interesting. Check this out. I didn't see this with the strings on. So it looks like the strings were going down a little bit too much and there's notches here. Now these notches were either made by the strings touching the wood before they hit the tuners, or these are notches that were made on purpose by Guitar Tech or the previous owner. There seems to be a little bit of a drop of super glue here. So I'm wondering if these slots got so low through wear that someone did that little super glue trick to try to raise them up a little bit. That's the third bolt there, it's an actual bolt. And here is the neck plate with the stamped number. So it's clearly more yellow here or a natural ash, I think is what this color was called. And then you can see if with age, it becomes a little bit more honey and amber towards the back of the body. All right, let's take this neck off. You know, a lot of people say that these 70s necks had a lot of slop in the pocket. I disagree, I can't even take this neck off. It's on there really tight, dang. 
All right, so yeah, no slop on the neck pocket here. This is what we wanted to really look at. We wanted to look at all the stamps. All right, so here we have the plate for the micro tilt system. So somewhere around right here is where the grub screw for the micro tilt touches the neck plate. So you have metal to metal and it can push this heel up so you can get the right angle for your strings. Then here's the bolt hole. So this is the actual proper bolt that would go in here. And it looks like it's just like a hollow hole and you got about a quarter of an inch of threads in there for this guy to actually seat in there, which is really cool. It just says W-E-B-R, another letter which I can't distinguish, and then G and T. We have the micro tilt system on the body. There's that grub screw that's gonna push the heel up. Here's a bolt hole where the bolt goes through. And then we have two additional holes here, which are very interesting. These could be for the paint stick. So there is a very faint inspection stamp, same color as on the neck, it's black. And this one has the number 33 in the center. Could be a 53, but I think it's 33. And then there is another inspection stamp, very similar to the black one, but it's in red and I can't read what's in the inside. Then you also have this signature here in Sharpie and a whole bunch of other kind of indicators and signatures. That is an R. That's a D, that's an M. This could say Pedro. All right, under magnification, that's definitely a name. It says P-E-D-R-O-M, so it's Pedro M, but it's really interesting artifact anyway to find inside a neck pocket, Pedro M. There's a whole bunch of writing in this pocket. I can't make it out. It's just a huge mess in there. Any type of cleaning solution I add just essentially runs the risk of removing these stamps. So, I'm not gonna run the risk of cleaning this. This is pretty dirty. There's a lot of leftover finish, there's grime, there's dirt. And I don't wanna put any type of cleaning solution on here because it does run the risk of removing the stamps. Might blow it out with some canned air. This is the safe thing to do here. You can see all that junk coming off. That's all the cleaning I'm gonna do to this. So next thing we're gonna do is figure out the jack plate problem. We have it slipping through the screw head. But let's fix this first. This is an easy, low-hanging fruit problem that we can knock out relatively quick. Screw's nice and tight in there, so it still is gripping the wood. This one is stripped. So it just went right through the hole. You can see it just slipped right through. So this screw, whether it's original or not, is no good to me, and I can't get it out. Just want one that'll grip it. Just one that's wide enough. I found a flathead that I'm able to actually have some purchase in there with. And I'm just grabbing a pair of pliers to grip this little screwdriver. I'm pushing downward pressure and it's turning. And little by little, I'm getting this guy to turn and come out. I have enough room here to grab him with pliers now if I want to. The head was too small and was going through the back plate hole, so I'm gonna replace him. See, it just goes right through that hole. Okay, so check this out. This is another reason why I think that the body has nitro. The lacquer, whatever it is, is actually peeling off with a very minimal agitation. It's just coming off, and I don't think polyurethane does this. Now, I'm not familiar with polyester, which was another finish uh, that they actually used in the 70s. So this might be polyester, I don't know, but the fact that it's flaking off like this just suggests that it can't be polyurethane. One, it's peeling off on its own. Two, it's the same amber vintage color as the headstock. And three, there's checking on the back. And I'm not really sure that polyurethane or polyester can check. You know, this was the era of the accountants when Leo Fender sold his company. So maybe this is just a cheap lacquer, an inexpensive way to cut corners. I don't know. In any case, it just takes minimal agitation to get this thing to come off. That's the other thing with this finish. I feel like if we do add some kind of cleaning solution, it will also irritate it, peel off more of it. So we're just gonna keep the mojo. We're not gonna clean it. We'll dust it off whenever possible. So looking at the solder joint, it is pretty sloppy. 
The jack itself looks like it's original. It looks old, uh, but that's definitely really sloppy. I can't believe that would come from the factory. It does not look like the other white wire. So this has been messed with for sure. Let's leave this loose for now. All right, we'll use a separate container for these pick guard screws. Alrighty, whoa, okay. Gorgeous, I mean, obviously dirty, but in that kind of like really cool archeological gorgeous way, there's green stuff growing in here. Like it's green, like there is, <laughs> who knows what it is. Okay, look at that. Okay, so this is pretty interesting because all the lacquer is just coming right off when I blow it with canned air. Whatever this lacquer is, whether it's nitro or polyurethane or polyester, who knows, but it just comes right off. Now, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, not even nitro, but I'm just going to stop because I just did that for demonstration purposes to show you, but it's incredible how cheap this lacquer was. And it really begs the question of what was Fender doing in the 70s? What is this stuff that it comes off so easily? I've never known nitro to do that. And you can clearly see a difference between like the gloss and then the satin where the actual lacquer is actually coming off. Pretty incredible. What is all this green stuff growing here? I, I don't want to know, but I don't want it living in my guitar. All right, so since this is under the pick guard, I think we will maybe clean it a little bit. All right, so these are lint-free four-ply aesthetic wipes. They're meant for like nail salons. And I use these on all my cleaning jobs, but they're lint free. And that's a key word. You don't have to get these or anything like them, but lint free is what you're looking for. And that's what I use because so, I don't want to leave behind anything. I don't want little strands of anything anywhere. I'm using the Dunlop stuff only because it's accessible, right? You don't want something that you have to buy halfway across the world and wait for shipping. I get this on Amazon, shipped to my door in two days, and it works. I've used this on pretty much every cleaning job, so you can check out all my other vids, but it's accessible. Accessibility, something quick, something easy. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to work for something. I just want to clean the guitar. I mean, what is that? It's lime green. What the heck is this stuff? Whatever this Dunlop cleaning solution is, it does leave behind a little bit of suddiness, like there's soap suds. This was the best I can do without hurting the finish. Everywhere that I was rubbing, we had some of that finish coming off. It was just flaking off everywhere. I got most of the intense green color off. And that's gonna have to be good enough. And we want to be as gentle as possible. And this is as gentle as I can get. This Dunlop stuff doesn't have, I mean, they don't tell you what's in it, but it, it doesn't react with vintage finishes like alcohol does. It's just a cleaner prep. So I think it's just soap. I think it's soapy water. That's all it is. All right. So in the seventies, Fender did not shield the entire pit guard like this. It was basically just a small little sliver, probably by the pots. And these are not the original gray bobbins from the 70s. These all have nearly the same date. So it has the Fender Custom Shop sticker. Someone's initials, A I or A Y or A S. Then a date, which is 1 to 11, so 2011. So the curious thing about the lacquer is that I'm not getting any of the peeling on the back. There's some checking, but the peeling's occurring on the inside of the horns and on the front of the guitar, but I'm not seeing that flaking of the lacquer on the back, which is really curious. Now, 
The neck is 100% polyurethane and it looks exactly the way you'd expect it to look. The fretboard does have a lot of it missing and peeling off. So I can't explain it. I mean, maybe this is just human chemical reactions because I mean, this is rounded over. Someone played this sucker. And there's just no poly on that entire edge. So there's finished checking on the back of the guitar and you can't really see it head on. You have to kind of look at it at an angle and I can only get some photographs of it. It's hard to shoot on the video, but it's all over the back on the belly carve, as you can see. And I don't think that polyurethane checks like this. Maybe polyester does. I don't know. So I still don't know what this finish is on the body. It's certainly doing different things on the back than on the front. All a mystery. Let's put the neck back on. So as I mentioned before, this is a very tight neck pocket. So I'm just going to go all the way to the very back. And I'm going to press down, see if we can hear this. That's tight. Screws. I want to test my electronics one last time before the strings go on. Nothing scratchy. We're good. Not much we need to do here. The string trees are definitely old and rusty. We're going to keep them. The headstock's nice. Tuners work. And uh, let's just put the strings on. That way we can start setting it up. I'm not going to mess with the neck. It just looks too cool. I don't know what's going on with this nut, if it's original or not, but it works. I'm not going to mess with it. We're going to leave it as is. <laughs> 